Hello everybody, welcome to Smack Talk Drones. Smack Talk Drones, a my new name, series. My name is Bobby Watts. My name is Burke Hammerer. And we come from the RC helicopter industry. Yep. From the field, we've been in it for the last 10, 12 years or whatever, pretty hardcore. And uh, this is our full uh, series dedicated to drones. So we welcome those of you who stuck with us through the RC helicopter stuff. And we're also gonna welcome our new guys who may be getting into smack talk for the first time because drones are right up their alley. Exactly. Yeah, so the RC helicopter stuff is, I mean, I think it's where all the multi-rotor stuff came from. And uh, a lot of the same things from the RC helicopter world apply into the multi-rotor world. So in the last few years, I've been walk working with multi-rotors a lot in the uh, uh, RC, um, the filming industry, TV commercials, movies and whatnot. And I know you've been messing around with the FPV racing stuff for a while. Yep. So we figured it'd be a great time to uh, bring in the drone stuff into the Smack Talk line. And we're really excited to bring it to you guys here in Smack Talk, you know? Absolutely. And you had your own drone yes. uh, for a little while. And yes. uh, it was the aerobatic drone. Yeah. So you, you've gained a lot of experience with that. Not to mention all the stuff you've done with, and like you said, in the film industry. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff relates, uh, you know, when it comes to the RF, the the the, the the 2.4 gigahertz technology we use with our radios and the yeah. motors and the speed controllers yeah. and flight and, controllers, and flight controllers. And yeah, it's, all that it's similar. It, it translates. It's really Bobby cool. has a lot of experience with uh, with uh, flight controllers working with Futaba back in the day. Mm -hmm. I've gained a lot of experience working with uh, flight controllers. I, I helped uh, help with the software development of one of the leading flyberless systems out there, and now I'm involved with another flyberless system for he uh, helicopters. So I mean, it all. It all relates really well. Comes that, together. Yeah, it comes together. Plus that combined with what Bobby has done in the past and all the research we've been doing with, with the actual video uh, aspect of, of the drones. No, no. Uh, I think that, that qualifies us. For uh, sure. As you could say. I think so. Yeah. So, we've seen the biggest thing out there is the FPV racing. That's what everybody's into. Um, my One of my business partners from Encore RC, Mike, he started the FPV racing. He got into it like five years ago and everyone's just making fun of him and giving him a bunch of crap at the field and stuff. And now he's just laughing because it's the biggest thing now. So we've been doing it for quite a while. So picked up some knowledge. So we'd love to share that with you. So this one's just going to be a big overview. This is going to be FPV racing and overview, right? Overview, yeah. And basically like when you think about it, for all of you that are familiar with Smack Talk, you know, we've been teaching people everything about helicopters from how to set them up to how to learn to fly them to how to set uh, uh, setups and blades and, 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 and certain things about helicopters like everything practically that we could think of everything that we, we could, could teach of. people about helicopters and that's our main goal here. Our goal is not to focus on an individual specific brand and attack that brand and show you everything there is to know about that brand. Right. Our goal is to give you an overview of Everything out there that you need to know the basics or the basis for yep. getting started with whatever we explain throughout the series, right. of course, in this episode, FPV racing. There's a lot of material to cover, a lot of it. It's I mean, a ton. It, we're just skimming it, the surface. We're just going to, yeah. yeah, absolutely. We're yeah. skimming the surface. And for all of you guys that are into helicopters and that have an interest in FPV racing or in drones in general, this will be a great source of information for you guys to just watch this episode or the, the, the next few episodes and, and learn what you need to do to get started instead of spending hours or days or weeks uh, searching through forums and pages and pages of information you just come here you watch our episodes and you learn the essentials to get you started for all of you guys that are seasoned that are FPV racers maybe you guys are you know racing already oh, yeah. you know traveling the country attending races and winning races well of course you're not going to learn it, this might not be very useful to you but yet you might find a couple of things here and there that are kind of uh, interesting that that you might pick up on for, for sure. sure yeah, yeah i yeah. think so so this episode once again we're just skimming the surface here so we just want to uh, bring the information to you where if you're just a guy who has an inkling into what fpv racing is and you've got an interest in it well then we're going to walk you through everything you need to know to get into it so what we're going to be talking about is you know what makes up fpv racing so you pretty much have three aspects you've got the aircraft, mm -hmm. you have ground station, and you've got the course. Mm -hmm. And those three things allow you to FPV race. Absolutely. We're gonna give a little talk about the history. We always like to 
to introduce you guys to, you know, or tell you guys where did these things come from? Where did these, you know, where did this FPV stuff come from? So we'll do a little history. We're gonna go over all the uh, things in needed to FPV race. We're gonna talk about some racing leagues. Is this legal rules and whatnot? And then we've got our FPV racing course back here. We're gonna try to break some stuff and run into each other. Yeah. And Bobby's gonna explain the, the aircraft yeah. options that are out there. And, yep. and then I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about ground stations and, and, and video receivers and goggles and things like that. All and that uh, yeah, and then we'll seal it off with, uh, I don't know, some crashes and, It'll be and nice. uh, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So anyway, welcome everybody. We're so glad you made it here. So this is Smack Talk Drones, episode one. Episode Here one. we go, new intro. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Roll it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about a little bit of a history. You know, we always like to tell you where these things came from because they didn't just pop out of nowhere. So as you can see here, I have some FPV racers and whatnot, and these things look a little bit different from the conventional quadcopter that you might be used to. I mean, uh, the, the multi-rotor, I would say, started as just a simple X, you know, just a simple X frame. And I'd say probably back in the early 2000s, um, maybe late 2000s, people were starting to integrate the airplane uh, motors and propellers onto a flat flying platform. And then, you know, I'd just say anywhere in the 2000s, they started kind of uh, getting together what would eventually become a multi rotor, way before we even thought about calling them drones. So they started as a basic X frame. And then companies like QAV were the first to come in and integrate things in such a way so that you could put your camera gear on the actual platform itself and make it easier to fly around while not looking at it line of sight. So QAV started with something like this guy. This is the QAV 250. And with the um, advancement of an airframe like this, it wasn't just a normal X anymore, you know? So this kind of looks like an X, but it's more of an H frame than anything. So they stretched the frame out a little bit. And what they ended up doing was making room for your cameras and your flight controller power distribution boards and whatnot. So what they did was they just made it the layout a little bit better for all the um, video components out there uh, versus like a regular X frame where all your guts are just in the middle. It's a little bit harder to um, you know, put all your video components on there without making it a really big pain in the butt. So something like this is the QAV 250. Um, so here we have our camera, we have our video transmitter in the back, we have our receiver for the 2.4 um, gigahertz and what the, the receiver for the transmitter. Um, and we're going to get into this in just a little bit. We're going to get into all the components that make the aircraft flyable. So QAV and other companies, they're just one of the first, like I said. They came out with some other stuff, like this big guy. This is a 550. So when we refer to sizes, by the way, we're talking about, it's real simple. It's just motor to motor. So 550 millimeters. Um, this one's a QEV 250, so it's 250 millimeters from motor to motor. And once again, this one really shows how the FPV stuff progressed. So they came out with different ways to integrate all the components in a long way. So this is definitely not just a standard X, you know. So these FPV racers, as we're looking at them now, they're starting to look a little bit more sleek and sleek, but it didn't always start at that, you know. Um, guys would cobble these together in their garage and stuff, and then you had guys like QAV come in and really start to make like a nice kit. So this one here is a QAV 550. This is my buddy Mike. So thank you, Mike, for letting us borrow this. This thing's a monster. This thing runs on six cell. 
It has a DJI Wukong in there. It even has a DJI Zenmuse for the uh, um, GoPro Hero 3 on the front. So as he's flying around, he's getting fully stabilized GoPro video, and it's just so awesome. This thing's a monster. It goes maybe 50, 60 miles an hour. It's, uh, it's absolutely wild. Um, as you can see, we have our FPV camera on the front here. So um, that's how the FPV stuff started a little bit. I'd say, honestly, it just started from hobbyists in their garage. And they put some stuff together, and guys like QEVs were the first ones to say, hey, you know, this FPV, there's something to it. Guys are putting glasses on their face and flying around. They're not looking at it anymore. So that's really where the FPV stuff started. And now we're here. Now we're into the, uh, into the racers. So, what makes an FPV racer? What it, why, are, why do people like it? Well, honestly, I think that this size became the racers just because it's small. It's cheap and affordable. No more, no less. Um, you can fit through smaller spots, it doesn't take up any room in your car, you know, you don't need big expensive batteries and whatnot. Things like these just run a little 3 cell battery, 1500, 1800 milliamp hours, and uh, they, they're just awesome, they're just a ton of fun. So just like to talk to you about the differences in some of these FPV racers. So I'd like to also point out the fact that I still firmly believe that FPV racing is in its infancy. It, it's just starting. So something like this, which is pretty popular right now, a QAV250, it's no different than what it'd look like if guys were cobbling it together in their garage. So this is where all the components are required to, uh, you just gotta put them together yourself. So as you can see, we have the motors and the flight controller and the ESCs in the bottom and a power distribution board. And there's a lot of work involved in this. I mean, this is hours and hours to sit there and solder and put all your components in, to set it up on your computer. I mean, I mean, there's honestly a lot of work involved with something like this and this is a kit form this one you just buy out of a kit you buy all your components separately and you put it together so this is the QAV 250 now you can get into something which incorporates a little bit more but still not too much something in like this this is the Scorpion Sky Strider super cool looking frame um, these guys put, decided to put in some dihedral here into the airframe so that you can see that it's not just a straight platform but it lifts up a little bit so the motors are in and just adds a little bit more stability while you're flying. Um, guys like Scorpion decided to put some dampened camera mounts in so you can see the main FPV camera has a little bit, bit of dampening in here. You can also adjust your camera angle with a slider like this. So in here you can, you know, these guys have put this kit out in the last few months, so you can see here's some uh, revisions to the QAV platform, but this one still, once again, requires you to have all your components, you got to install them separately, and uh, this is honestly for your more experienced FPV racer, that's for sure, because you simply just have to wrench on a lot more stuff. You got to put more things together. This one has features like removable arms to where the QAV is just a solid, you know, piece of uh, G10 just cut straight out. So while we're talking about that, we can also look at the differences in airframes here. So you have the QAV 250 here features a G10 fiberglass airframe, which is much cheaper. It's about four times cheaper to get G10 than it is to get carbon from a manufacturer standpoint. That's real carbon, by the way. Where Scorpion has carbon. So carbon fibers, lighter, stronger. Um, G10 is great. It's easier to cut, but it's just, uh, it's not quite as strong and it's a little heavier. So it doesn't really matter which one you prefer. It's just, I mean, when it's out, when you're looking at getting an FPV racer, it's just some things to look into. So you have your carbon fiber and you have your G10. So, in my opinion, where the FPV stuff is going is to in more integration, just more things integrated all into one. And I think companies like Immersion RC, Emacs, uh, you know, the guys with the Gemini, Team Black Sheep, I think that some of these newer models out there that have more integration into it, I think it's going to make your life a little bit easier, especially as a first time FPVer. So, the FPV stuff, from what I'm seeing for, I'd say, mass markets, are moving into guys like these things, where it's. Uh, um, everything comes a little bit more integrated. So this is the Vortex by Immersion RC. This thing just comes ready to go. I mean, it's built and you hardly have to do anything to it. You just add your battery and you go. So these things feature, you know, a five inch propeller as most of these others do. Um, this one is, you can see here, we have an angled camera option with a flat motor. And with something like this, the Nighthawk Pro from the Emacs, you have a straight camera and an angle motor. So we can get into all this sort of stuff later. But these, these things also feature 
uh, not too many wires running from it. So with the QAV and whatnot, you see more wires. Whereas this one, all the wires are integrated into the bottom frame. So it's pretty darn cool. Now for a high class FPV racer, do you want this in a competition? I don't know. That's up for you to decide. But if you're just kind of a back, you know, backyard weekend warrior and you don't maybe have the time to swap components in and out and do all this soldering, something like this that's a plug and play option is really cool. So it's definitely um, a different approach to it for sure in the FPV game. So this is just a, a, a real quick intro to what the FPV machines look like, how the components are laid out, a little history of it here. And uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the aircraft more in depth. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, every single component on this aircraft, on these aircrafts here, the FPV racers that uh, come together and make the airframe itself and all the components involved here. So the ne next we're going to talk about everything that's involved in the aircraft side of the FPV racer. So let's move into that segment. Now that we know where FPV came from and the ideas behind it, these guys putting goofy glasses on their face, let's talk about what makes the aircraft fly. Let's talk about the machine itself. So, the first part of the whole contraption actually doesn't start with the machine, but it starts with the radio. So, here I've got some popular brands here. I've got a Tyrannus, I've got a Futaba radio, I've got a Spectrum radio. So the cool part about FPV is it really doesn't require a super intense computer radio to fly. I mean, just any, you know, I mean, this is one of the lower budget radios out there for in the mid $200, the uh, Tyrannus radio. Uh, this one's open source. So this will allow you to do pretty much whatever you want. I mean, it's overkill. Um, so for, for not too bad of a price. And then, I mean, here we have a uh, Futaba, Futaba 14SG, and here's a Spectrum. This one's a DX9. So there's many different computer radios out there. Um, all these radios are gonna allow you to fly within line of sight. Um, what I found with FPV flying in general is that it really doesn't go as far as you think it would. So we've certainly had it where the aircraft will go out of range just because of the, uh, um, the limited range on the uh, aircraft radio here. So this is the radio. Just recommend if you want to get into FPV, just get a computer radio. Anything with a computer, that's pretty much all you need. And you only need four channels. You're just talking about throttle, you're talking about elevator, you're talking about aileron, and you're talking about rudder. That's it. And then maybe five, six for some auxiliary channels to arm and disarm the board. So that's about it. So these are the radios. We'll get these out of the way here. Next we'll talk about the aircraft. What does the aircraft need to actually fly? So there's about, I believe it's 10 different components here, including the radio. So there's different components on these aircraft that makes it fly. So I'm gonna utilize the QAV250 here because once again, this is a, uh, not an old school way of doing it, but this one's the one where it's a uh, do it yourself, build it up from the ground, just sort of a kit. And this one has everything out in the open where the integrated machines are a little bit harder to see each of the components. So that's where we're going to start with this. So on the QAV250, let's start from um, the power plant. Let's start from what gives it the power. So first we have a battery. So batteries in FPV machines seem to be about three cell or four cell. I think some guys are getting into the 6S stuff, but they all these batteries seem to be 3S, 4S, anywhere from 800 milliamps to 1800, 2000. There's really no uh, limit on the batteries, you know, what size you can put in here. If you're in a race, race, racing league or something, we can get into that later. There's restrictions and whatnot. So you have the battery. With battery, you've got all sorts of connectors out there. You have the uh, XT60, you've got Deans, you've got EC3, EC5, million different types of connectors out there, million different types of balance leads. But from what we see, Deans is pretty popular, XT60 is popular, and the JST XH balance connectors are very popular. So um, I would recommend uh, at least a 30C battery. This is pretty important here. The cheaper you get with the C rating, uh, it's just not going to hold up over time. That's really, up, that's really all it is. So with at least a 30C battery, I think you should be good for FPV racing. These are a 35C battery. I think that for the most part, anything at least 30C should last for a good while and it'll give you enough uh, of a um, peak when, you know, it'll give you plenty of juice. When the motors are cranking and the props are pulling hard, the battery with at least a 30C should be able to give you plenty of power. So that's the battery. Next thing we'll talk about is the speed controller. So a battery goes to speed controllers. So the speed controllers is the gas pedal of your machine. Um, 
pretty much what happens is you give your throttle an input and it goes through your flight controller and then that power goes through the speed controller and out to the motors supplied with power from the battery so um, there's lots and lots we can get into about speed controllers um, more or less you you're there they come by ratings the amperage so these in here in this QAV 250 these are a 12 amp um, speed controller and as you can see in here this one's shoved in between the power distribution board and the airframe itself so with speed controllers you've got your positive negative then you've got a wire going out that goes to your flight controller here now there's lots of things we'll get into later like Simon K flashing one shot lots of different features like this that make some speed controllers better than others but pretty much I'd say at least the 10 amp speed controller should do okay um, you might as well get it for 3 and 4s rating just in case you want to get into that later but that's that's pretty much it that's the gas pedal of your of your uh, of your multi-rotor here so speed controller next is the motor speed controller makes the motor spin um, here in this machine let's see what we got on here this one's a uh, 2204 size motor anything from an 1800 to 22 seem to be about right for FPV racing I know this one's an 18 in here so we're also looking at a KV value which is RPMs per volts so the lower the KV the lower the motor is going to turn per volt you give it higher KV the faster it's going to turn so usually a 1800 to 2200, 2400 uh, motors will range in, in that size for the FPV racing. Um, it just depends on your setup and what you want to achieve with it to, you know, for me to recommend a motor to you. But I would just recommend just look at like a nice quality motor out there. Um, and there's just so much to say about motors. We'll definitely get into that for sure. But mostly all these motors are outrunners where they, uh, the can spins around the center core of the motor. So this is your motor. motor. So battery, speed controller, then it goes to the motor. Power is finally put out by the propeller. So here we have some, uh, I believe these are GemFan propellers or the HQ propellers. Um, propellers are simply just like an airplane where it gives you a, a overall diameter and a pitch. So these one here are a 5x3 or a 5x4. They seem to be very popular for FPV racing. Uh, seems like if a machine's a 250 size, it'll only swing a 5 inch prop. If it's a 280 size, it can swing up to a 6 inch prop. So propellers, I would just recommend honestly something cheap while you're starting out. There's plastic, there's um, fiber reinforced plastic, and then you have carbon fiber and all in between. So propellers, you can, you can try them out, you can try some different things. We have two bladed, we have three bladed propellers, lots of different ways to go there. Um, we've got the uh, front left and back right motor spinning the same direction, so these two props are the same. And then the front right and back left, these are the same as well. So front left, back right, the same front right back left are the same they ro rotate in the same direction with the same type of propellers so that's our uh, that's what makes it physically achieve lift so now what's next uh, we have the radio we need to receive the signal from the radio so the next thing is the receiver so on this one this one's a spectrum receiver so this would work with the spectrum type of radio um, and this receiver here simply just picks up the 2.4 signal to the radio here now with FPV racing, some guys are FPV flying long distance. Some guys are going to other receivers, other frequencies such as 433 on Dragonlink or whatnot for long range, I mean 10 miles plus. So um, for FPV racing, it seems like guys are keeping it real light, real simple with the 2.4 radio. Once again, this will go about line of sight or, or more. Um, so this one here, as you can see, we're uh, in this in this receiver. It's going. I got some wires going from the receiver to the flight controller, and this is just using a regular PWM signal from the receiver to the flight controller. There's different ways of communicating between the receiver and the flight controller, such as PPM or S bus. This is where one wire takes the place of five or six, where it just runs one signal through the uh, through the wire from the receiver to the brain to the flight controller. We can get into that later once again. So our receiver comes into our flight controller here, and there we have our flight controller. So this one here is a nano -Wii. This is a multi wii based board. Uh, multi wii it uses very similar uh, gyros and accelerometers uh, to like a Nintendo Wii video game controller. So these things are great. They're relatively cheap now. All these flight controllers, you can get all of them for like 50 bucks or under. It's great. Um, a lot of these you have to solder the pins on yourself and flash them yourself. We'll get into that later once again. But the flight controller is the brain. 
this thing allows it to uh, maintain stability and to fly the aircraft with ease. If you didn't have this flight controller, uh, this would not be possible. No, no way at all. Uh, so popular brands of flight controllers are Multiwee, uh, Naze 32, that's a real big one. The Naze for sure is a, a very big board right now. You have the CC board. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of boards out there that are really popular, so uh, we can get into those. We'll probably designate a whole episode just to flight controllers. Um, so once again, flight controllers always uh, in the middle of the aircraft, 99% of the time it's in the middle of the aircraft, just allows it to know where it is in the machine and seems to fly better that way. So we have our flight control here. This is the brain, once again. Okay, so now we need to be able to see where we're going. So next we'll look at videos. So this is the, uh, the video camera we have right here. This is just a, uh, a cheap closed circuit TV um, camera. That's where these all came from, like security type cameras. They're anywhere from 20 bucks to 100 bucks, I guess. Mostly everything right now is standard def. The high definition stuff is coming, you know what it is. But right now everyone's just using a standard def camera. There's different settings and whatnot, but pretty much just any sort of um, uh, uh, closed circuit um, security camera seems to work well. And there's interchangeable lenses and you can adjust your focus right here as well. So the camera then runs to the video transmitter. So while you're looking nice and close, this is the video transmitter right here. And uh, so with video transmitters, we get into uh, lots of different specs, frequencies, power output, antennas and whatnot. So it seems like everyone with FPV racing starts with 5.8 gigahertz. It's just the common frequency out there for video frequency. So everyone's flying 2.4 on the radio, 5.8 on the video transmitter. Uh, they seem to work very well line of sight. Um, there's different power outputs that you can choose. So I believe in some racing leagues, the uh, limit is 250 milliwatt. And I've seen these go up to, uh, um, I've seen them go up to a thousand milliwatts, so one watt. I mean, it's crazy in power. So depending on the uh, racing league you're doing or racing with buddies or whatnot, um, for the most part, the lower the power, the less you're gonna step on other channels. So if you got five or six guys racing, you're not gonna step on each other's frequency, but the less distance you can go, the less range you can go. Uh, the higher the power, simply just the more power it's putting off from this machine and the further you can go if your antenna setup is correct. Um, usually we go with anything from uh, 200 to 600 seems about right. So this one has dip switches on there where you can physically select your channel, analog. Once again, going back to it, FPV is in its infancy. This is analog. I mean, we've got the coolest digital radio here, but this is just some, you know, 50 year old technology here with this analog stuff and dip switches. So once again, I have a feeling when this starts uh, evolving, the video is going to become HD and your uh, video transmission signal is going to become digital and it's all matched and paired. You won't step on each other's toes or shoot each other down. So I think that's where it's heading. So once again, 5.8 is the popular frequency. Um, another one that's really popular is 1.2 or 1.3 gigahertz. Much lower, travels further. Um, I've seen that, I, be I, I honestly believe after trying it for a while, I think the video quality is a little bit less than 5.8, but 1.2, 1.3 seems to go real far. So uh, for those of you guys who want to do long range racing and whatnot, the 1.2 or 1.3 seems to be a little bit better. Although channels are limited here in the USA. I think you can only get two channels, so 1.2 or 1.3. Although if you order from China, you can probably get more channels, but I didn't tell you that. So that's our video transmitter here. And the last portion of the whole setup that we'll talk about is the antenna. So on your video transmitter here, you've got uh, a video antenna. So this one, once again, so this one's a 1.2. I forgot this one isn't my model. So this one here is a 1.2 transmitter here. Uh, this one, for example, is a 5.8. So this one's a 1.2 or 1.3. And this one has just a simple whip antenna on it. After doing some testing, this one seemed to work just fine for this antenna as far as we were flying it. But there's many different types of antennas. Here we've got a mushroom, we've got clover leaf, we've got patches, we've got all sorts of different types of antennas. So we can get into that later for sure because there's a lot to be said for changing up your antenna uh, system here. So. With all that said, this is the aircraft. This is the guts that makes the thing fly. You can have some peripherals in there like LEDs. Uh, you can also have some other cameras on board to allow for uh, recording while you're flying. So for example, 
for example, on this aircraft, we have two cameras. So we have a, uh, a real-time video camera, and we have this camera called a Mobius, which records in high definition your actual flight. So there's many different varieties and whatnot. There's many different things you can change in and out to make the aircraft better or you know, do different features that you're looking for it to do. But for the most part, these are the 10 key features that make an aircraft fly. Now that you know how it's flying, let's take a look at the ground station. So let's see what's involved in the ground station. How do we get all this back down to us so that we can race? So Bert's gonna go over that for you guys. So Bobby just finished explaining the aircraft, the transmitters, and all the other equipment. One very important thing about FPV is your ground station. Why? Because you need to be able to see where you're going. And in my opinion, there's four important aspects of a ground station. First, you need a receiver. Then you need an antenna. Then you need a monitor. And of course, a power source to power everything up. Um, as you can see here, this is made by Fat Shark uh, Immersion RC. It's, it's a very popular set of goggles. The goggles are pretty much your monitor here. And you basically buy a receiver that you plug into your goggles. It looks like that. It's a pretty small piece of electronic right there. And uh, they're pretty inexpensive too, just a couple dozen dollars or whatever, 20, 30, 40 bucks. Um, this is 5.8 gigahertz, but you could do anything you want. I mean, you could do uh, 1.2, 1.3, you could do uh, 2.4. I'm not sure if 2.4 would be compatible with this, but there's different options. So basically you get your receiver, you plug it into your goggles, and then you install your antenna on your receiver. That creates your link down to the goggles. The goggles is your monitor, basically. And then you power it up with a battery. In this case, this, this uh, system right here comes with a set of uh, just a battery, just a two-cell battery. It's just, it's just a simple lithium polymer battery plug into your goggles. What is really cool about this setup right here is that it's all uh, sort of self-contained. So when you're flying around, uh, you know, you don't have to, you don't feel like you're attached to anything. When you, when you travel and you go to an event somewhere or something like that and you want to bring your, your device, you just basically bring your goggles and with you and that's it. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a really convenient thing because it's just very portable and very comfortable to wear and so forth. Another alternative is to have uh, a ground station, a true ground station uh, with the regular monitor. So instead of using goggles, you just use a monitor. In this case, uh, you can see right here, there's a monitor. You buy a receiver, uh, which you can buy from any FPB store, and then you plug that receiver into your monitor and you can use the monitor to fly your your FPV racer around, you obviously would have to be looking at the monitor screen instead of looking at your goggles, a matter of personal preference, 100%. Uh, obviously, it's not as portable and as, uh, as comfortable because you're going to need, again, a receiver. You're going to have to plug the receiver to your monitor, and then you're going to have to find a tripod or something to mount your monitor. You need an antenna that needs to be mounted somewhere in here and so forth. In this particular situation right here, you can see this monitor is actually a receiver as well. It's all in one, so it makes it really uh, portable, I guess you could say. You still need a tripod, and you still have more... It's not as portable as having your goggles, but you have everything all together. Receiver, monitor, all in one. And this particular unit right here is even better because it has what we call a diversity receiver. What that means is the receiver has two channels, and it's basically uh, two separate channels that are linked to two different antennas. So whatever better link it gets through a particular channel is the channel that it displays on the monitor or in your goggles. So you just get a little bit better overall video experience because you can use different kinds of antennas that can achieve different kinds of purposes. We're going to get into antennas later. There's a lot to talk about antennas. But as you can see here, I have a regular mushroom type antenna up top on one of the channels. And then I have a what they call a patch antenna, and they're both plugged into this receiver that's built into the monitor. The receiver picks the signal, the best signal it can get, and it displays it onto the monitor. Um, this setup right here also has an output for video, which you can use this output to plug it into your existing goggles if you wanted to use the receiver that's here and not the one that's here. Uh, if you did that, then your friends, for instance, could be watching your flight through this monitor while you're watching your own flight through your goggles. But it's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff right here. I mean, there's a lot of different options for these things. And again, we're going to get more into detail. One thing that's important to mention, I guess, is you can record your flight. So a flight recorder is a really cool thing to have. If you have a big, uh, I guess you could call it clumsy 
uh, sort of like ground station right here where you have you know your monitor your receiver your antennas you have your power source in the form of a lipo strapped somewhere in here into this contraption you can get a, a dvr recorder such as this one right here it's a really cool device you plug this into your monitor or your receiver actually and your receiver will send the signal to this and record your flight um, another thing that's cool about recording your flight is, for example, if you had a set of goggles like these fat shark goggles right here, this one's got an actual like micro SD port right here. So you can stick a micro SD card into your goggles, push a button and record your flights. Obviously, you're recording the signal as it comes through your goggles or through your receiver on your ground station. So when you do that, you're not getting a true high definition, high quality video. You're getting the same thing you're seeing when you're flying. If you want high quality video, you need to get into a different type of camera like a Mobius or a, a, a GoPro camera that's recording parallel to your flight. But this is kind of cool to have because if you're flying around in a wooded area and you end up crashing, you can play back your video and see exactly where you crashed and it might make it easier for you to, to go and find your model. So, so that's about it the, for ground stations. There's one important thing. It's actually not the least important. It's probably the most important. The chair. You do need a chair when you fly FPV. Have you ever tried to do FPV? If you've never done FPV before, when you put these goggles on, trust me, you're, you're gonna fall on your butt. So make sure you have a chair and you're sitting very comfortably. And when you put your goggles on, if you start doing crazy stuff or you go out of control, you're not going to tip over and fall. Thank you. Another important consideration when it comes to FPV racing is setting up a course. Cheapest way to do it, spray paint. This thing is designed to be used on grass. You just take it and spray your, uh, your markings, whatever you want to do, an arrow, a line, two lines, or whatever you want to do to create a delimiter for where you want to fly around. Um, pretty inexpensive. It covers like a thousand feet, linear feet or whatever. Grass grows, goes away, so it doesn't hurt anything. So great way, great way to set up a course. You can also use a flag like you see here. Uh, flags are even better because they're easier to spot from the air. They stand taller so you don't feel like uh, you're cheating. If you don't, you know, miss the, if you miss the, the spray paint, nobody's really going to know but yourself. Flag, if you miss it, you're going to hit it or it's going to be obvious that you missed it. So there's many different ways to set up your own course and uh, here's the thing there's some racing leagues out there there's several of them um, there's there's a couple of real real popular ones they set up their own rules their own specifications on how to create a course how to set up a course uh, most of them use gates uh, they don't use flags they don't use paint they just set up these gates that look like an arch and uh, you know they, they set their courses up and, and they're pretty serious about what they're doing there's a lot of uh, a good racers professional racers I get I guess you could say that that attend these meets and and, and race with these with these high-end or, or really formal I guess you could say leagues uh, we're not here to talk about that we're here more to talk about what you need to do to get better or to, to get good I guess you could say at, at FPB racing first thing you got to do is just go on open field um, don't worry about flags don't worry about spray paint just go to a big open field and learn to fly it um, I'm assuming that you already know how to fly line of sight that's very important we stress the importance of line of sight control first once you can fly your quad back and forth just by looking at it and then put the goggles on and again go to a big open field and just practice uh, once you get good at it, then you can start getting creative with setting up your courses like I showed here. Spray paint, flag, you know, in this particular situation, I guess I'm really fortunate. This is my own property right here. And as you can see, I have a lot of trees. So it makes it really cool because, you know, I can set up my own course around the trees. And, you know, it makes it pretty interesting because there's a lot of tight gaps in between some of these branches. And, but really, the sky's the limit. You know, Bobby and I are engineers, so our minds work three-dimensionally. Uh, just going through a gate is a lot of fun and it's cool. But we like things to be a little different. Go up high and go in between two tree branches. You know, things that are really kind of awkward and intricate and not easy to do is what makes this FPV flying really, really fun. So go ahead and fly some more and get some enjoyment out of it. So now the big question, is all this stuff legal?
like I've seen drones and the news and stuff. Apparently they're uh, the worst thing to happen to this whole country for quite a while, but no. Yes, it's legal. So this FPV, first person view, all this flying, it's very much legal. So here in the USA, we've got the AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics, located in the middle of nowhere in Muncie, Indiana, with a beautiful site. And the AMA is our uh, insurance. They're the voice for us. You know, they, they offer insurance to us pilots, and they're the lobbyist group for the uh, RC pilots like myself, like Bert, like everybody else. The AMA stance on it is very cool. It's very uh, positive, you know, and they support it. The president, Bob Brown himself, flies FPV. He loves it. He loves multi-rotors. So the AMA has a few different rules and guidelines that they list for us modelers that we should adhere to when we fly. Uh, various countries, whatever country you're in, UK, Australia, Asia, and whatnot, take a look at your own version of the AMA's rules and whatnot. But the BMFA, for example, over in the UK, you guys have very similar rules to what we have here in the US with the AMA. Anywho, in the US, the AMA, here's some simple rules that they list out. Number one, your aircraft has to be under 15 pounds in order to fly first person view. Anything beyond that, they won't cover you. Meaning if you were to have an accident, they won't cover you. They won't insure you beyond your homeowner's insurance. Um, it's not illegal. I don't know if you're going to jail for it, but they're not gonna cover you. Next rule, you've gotta have a spotter. So you gotta have a spotter standing by your side, looking at you the whole time making sure that your model isn't going near something that it shouldn't be. So he's got line of sight, you're under the hood, you're in the goggles, make, you know, making your flight. The next rule, under 70 miles an hour. 70, that's fast. So, I mean, these guys are preparing for, you know, the future with these new models and whatnot, the new technology. So it's really cool that they're, they've got us in mind. I, I like it. Next one, it's gotta be within line of sight. So your spotter's gotta have a line of sight of it the whole time. So if you're flying miles and miles away and he can't see it anymore, unfortunately you're not adhering to the AMA's guidelines and their rules. So you're gonna have a problem with that. Uh, beyond that, they've got some little things in there. It's like uh, your first flight on any model, you've gotta have visual line of sight for the, the shakedown of the flight and you've got to have a few flights on it, solid visual line of sight before you go full FPV with it. But beyond that, honestly, it's just common sense. So they list a few rules, regulations, a few guidelines, but for the most part, a lot of it's just common sense. They fully support us. It's, it's not a problem, you know? So if, if you were to be flying your model and something were to happen and heaven forbid you hit a piece of real estate or property, if you're flying here and you hit the neighbor's trailer or something, AMA will actually cover you. It's the same rules we've got for RC helicopters, RC airplanes and whatnot. If you're being a good modeler, a good responsible modeler, AMA is gonna cover you. So insurance, yep, it's totally legal. Um, don't be a moron with it. Don't fly in public crowds. Don't fly over people. Don't do that stuff with, with these multi-rotors and these drones because your FPV, you can go into a lot of different places that you couldn't go before with an RC helicopter or an RC airplane. So just be responsible, use some common sense. Now the next thing we're gonna get into is, so this whole governing body is cool with us flying it. So now we wanna fly here, yes, in, in our backyard, it's awesome, but what if we wanna race other people? How about leagues? So yes, there's plenty of racing leagues. Here in the USA, we're in Orlando, Florida. The, one of the biggest leagues here close to us is called Multi-GP. These guys have races all over the country, different groups, different uh, tiers, different classes and stuff. They're super into it. And these guys are popping up, uh, racing leagues like this are popping up all over the country, all over the world. All you have to do is just Google search FPV Racing League and you see them everywhere. So just take a look on the internet. There's plenty of racing leagues. There's meetup groups. There's lots of different places out there where you can go and meet up with fellow modelers who are interested in racing FPV competitively. They've got their own classes, their own rules and whatnot. So we know it's legal. There's lots of FPV racing leagues out there. You should definitely get involved in if you're interested in this for sure. So now this is the time. Mr. Camera and I are going to get our stuff and we're going to do some flying here in the uh, course de camera. So it should be fun here. So let's do some racing. Okay guys, thanks for watching our uh, very first episode of our drones series of Smack Talk. Drones, baby. Drones. drones. They're yeah, taking yeah. over. You think? Oh, hell yeah. Uh, Heck yeah. Uh, helicopters are still cool. Oh, for sure. For yeah. Sure. Okay. But anyway, so it's time for us to race. It's the most important thing of the whole FPV racing thing. And and for all of you guys that didn't get the information you wanted, don't be disappointed. This is a long, 
long series. Like we said before, lots to cover. We're gonna no doubt try to get over. Like we're gonna talk about all kinds of stuff. We're gonna be very episodes. detailed eventually. But yeah, it's just yeah. a nice overview. Yeah, it's just an overview. So now I'm gonna. So smoke now I'm gonna this kick guy. his butt. I'm gonna <laughs> smoke him. I'm gonna smoke him. So until next time. It's race time. What makes it fly? I would say the most important, if not the most important part of FPB flying is the ground station. Why ground station? Because you need to be able to see where you're going with your FPB race. <laughs> Sorry, <guys. laughs> hold on, hold on, pause for a little bit. Let the plane go away. Oh, the plane. The plane. In one, I'm gonna nail it. I'm getting old. Ready? Okay, all right. Now wait, let's. Wait, wait. I'm just. <laughs> I just figured it'd be a good option. Uh -huh. All right, okay. Going. So, a ground station, in my opinion, is comprised of four different components. So, you have a monitor, uh, you have a. Let's go back. Just reinitialize the thing. Dude. I just did that. I was having issues today. Huh? What the? 
No, put that on your face. On your no, head. but it looks goofy. It's awesome. This reminds me of the old days. All right, ready?